Since the end of the Second World War, lots of wrecks of the ships sunk in that period have been discovered. Most of them have been designated as war graves, given legal protection against damage and removal. Many of the sites have even become popular diving locations, but over the years, at least 40 of these World War II shipwrecks have disappeared. These wrecks were illegally salvaged for scrap metal, but why would anyone go to the trouble of trawling the ocean depths for some scrap metal? I mean, steel's not exactly expensive or scarce, is it? Well, the reason is, something happened soon after these ships sank, which has been contaminating all modern steel produced after that time. And that event is the invention of nuclear weapons in 1945. Not just those initial tests, but the decades of atmospheric nuclear testing that occurred as the Cold War heated up. Over 500 above ground nuclear tests were carried out between 1945 and 1996. And even though nuclear weapons are pretty clean in terms of how much of the radioactive material they use up in the detonation versus how much gets released as fallout, that amount of nuclear detonations still increased the global background radiation by 0.11 millisieverts per year by its peak in 1963. And to put that in context, 0.11 millisieverts isn't really a lot, it's not going to cause anyone any harm. Your average background radiation for a year from natural sources is 2.4 millisieverts, so it's well within the safe range. But that increase in background radiation did have some effects on steel production for one. You see, in steel production, iron ore is heated in a furnace to create molten pig iron, which has a high carbon content. With that amount of carbon present, the iron produced would be very brittle. So what they do is blow in a load of air into the mixture while it's molten to react with a lot of the carbon, turning it into carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And you do that until the carbon content is down to a few percent, and then you have steel. Modern processes pump in oxygen rather than air, but it's the same principle. But since the advent of nuclear testing, all that air is contaminated with elevated amounts of cobalt-60 and other radioactive isotopes. And as a result, all steel produced since 1945 has an elevated level of background radiation compared to steel produced before that time. Again, it's nowhere near enough to be a health concern, even if you're wearing it against your skin every day. The increase wouldn't even be detectable by most commercial Geiger counters because it's so close to the background level. But if you were building a piece of equipment whose sole job is to be very sensitive to radiation, then yeah, it might be a problem. Like for example, whole body count machines, which are very sensitive pieces of hospital equipment used to detect all the minute amounts of radiation coming out of a human body. They're used on people who are exposed to radiation to ascertain how much of a dose they received. And they're so sensitive, they can actually detect the potassium-40 in your body. Potassium-40 is a radioactive isotope of potassium. It makes up about 0.01% of the natural potassium that we consume. And it's a very low level of radiation. A regular Geiger counter wouldn't pick up your body as being radioactive. These machines are housed inside essentially what looks like a bunker. It's a small room surrounded on all sides by 20 centimeters thick of this pre-war steel with a big heavy door to seal it shut made out of the same thickness of steel and that's essentially to block any radiation coming from outside the room so the only thing you're measuring is the human inside lying down and these machines are still being built for hospitals all around the world so where are they getting tons of this pre-war steel and the answer is ships built before 1945 but that doesn't mean all these hospitals are involved in some black market buying all the steel from these illegally salvaged World War II shipwrecks. A lot of World War II ships did survive and they were eventually decommissioned and scrapped and that's where a lot of this pre-war steel comes from. And that's exactly what happened to the USS Indiana in 1962. It was decommissioned and plates from the steel hull were melted down and used to create whole body counters at the Illinois Veteran Affairs Hospital and Utah Medical Center. But by the 80s, most of the World War II era ships had already been decommissioned and scrapped, so there wasn't really much of a source there anymore. So shipwrecks did become another big source of pre-war steel. And as we said, this can be a contentious issue if the ships were sunk in battle as they're designated military graves. 
but sometimes this isn't the case. In 1919, near the end of the First World War, a German fleet off the coast of Scotland scuttled their own ships rather than let them be seized by the British. So as these ships aren't war graves and they're in reasonably shallow water, some of them have been salvaged and the steel has been used to create radiation detecting equipment at a Scottish hospital. And some of that salvaged steel has also been rumoured to have been used to build the Voyager probes, which are now travelling into stellar space, although NASA has been unable to confirm where the steel came from. So that's some of the legitimate sources of this pre-war steel, but we do still have these 40 missing shipwrecks, which have ended up somewhere. And it's obviously a lot harder to trace black market pre-war steel, but let's just hope it's being used for some useful scientific purposes. But this is an ongoing issue. These illegal salvage operations are happening with increasing intensity in the South China Sea. But rather than diving to these wrecks, Malaysian barges are using powerful magnets to strip the holes of the ships and pull up the scrap steel and load up the barges. And supposedly they sell this pre-war steel to China, who reportedly pay up to five times the market rate of steel for it. There's apparently high demand for this low background steel in China for producing high sensitivity medical and scientific equipment. Some experts are skeptical of the idea that these salvage operations are mainly focusing on getting this low background steel. You see, the level of background radiation from atmospheric nuclear testing peaked in 1963. But at that point, a treaty banning most atmospheric nuclear testing was passed since then, the human-caused atmospheric radiation has dropped 95%, so we're almost back at the pre-war levels of background radiation. So these experts argue that given this massive decline in excess background radiation and today's technology's ability to compensate for background radiation, the hunt for low background steel is redundant. And that might be true, these scavengers might just be scavenging for scrap metal. On the other hand, if you were trying to develop some incredibly sensitive equipment and you had a large budget, wouldn't you still go for the lowest background materials available? I mean, modern steel is still slightly above background levels, so pre-war steel is technically still better. I guess I'll leave you with the same question I did in my video about Roman lead. Do you think the scientific value of reusing this steel outweighs the moral problems of potentially desecrating these war graves? I think that question might be a bit too cut and dry considering I've already talked about the other sources we have for this steel and the lessening need we have for it and how recent in history the Second World War is compared to the Roman shipwrecks I talked about in the other video. So imagine nuclear testing started up again and these shipwrecks were the only source of low background steel we had. How long do you think it would take before people were morally okay with desecrating these war graves? 100 years? 500 years, 1000 years. Eventually people feel completely disconnected from the events and it's just archaeology isn't it? 